アメン
for this day gathered in your name calling out to you your glory like a fire awakening desire we burn our hearts with you you're the reason we're here you're the reason we're singing open up the heavens we want to see you open up the floodgates almighty river flowing from your heart filling every part of our prayer your presence in this place your glory on our face we're looking to the sky Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now, Lord, fill our eyes. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see. Good morning, everyone. My name is Brady Witten, and it's my privilege to welcome you to worship here at First United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. On behalf of our congregation, I welcome you to this time of worship. Thank you for spending your Sunday morning with us. During worship, it's our hope. It's our prayer. That you will encounter God. That you will come to know Jesus. Through a verse. Through a song. Through a story. Through a prayer. Through a person. Through a smile. It's time to praise. It's time to pray. It's time to worship. Greetings, everyone. My name is Brady Witten, and I welcome you to online worship here at the America Street Service of First United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So uh, as we move into this time of worship, I want to invite you to do something, and that is to share this opportunity to worship with others. And so uh, if you're on uh, Facebook, I would encourage you to start a watch party. That's a way you can uh, share and invite others to worship. Uh, and if you're on our online church platform or YouTube, I just encourage you to uh, share the link there. You'll see opportunities to share. Share it on social social media, uh, text friends, send them emails, and uh, you could really be a part of sharing the gift of worship with uh, someone this morning. And, and who knows uh, who might need that gift at this time. So uh, please do that for me. So Tim Keller says that we don't get to decide to worship. Uh, everyone worships something. What we get to decide is what we worship. And so as we gather for this set-apart time, uh, I want to encourage you to think about the one that we worship, the God who is our creator, sustainer, and redeemer, uh, the God who is three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, I want you to think about the fact that we gather to worship the God who offers us new life in Christ Jesus. Will you pray with me? Holy God, you are light, and in you there is no darkness at all. And we ask that during this time of worship, you would shift our focus 
from what is false to what is true, from the ways of the world to the ways of your kingdom. Pour your Holy Spirit out upon us and help us to truly worship you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken oh I won't be shaken and my fear doesn't stand a chance when I Stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. Captive to the lies. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. Oh, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance.
Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 22nd chapter, and I'm going to be beginning with the first verse. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, How did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So uh, this is a tough parable, huh? And uh, I want to get us thinking about a few questions as we dive into it. Uh, Is Jesus saying that a person who has said yes to God's invitation, so a person who comes to the party, could still miss out on life with God? Uh, Is Jesus saying that God kicks some people out of the kingdom of heaven? Well, let's explore a little further and, and see. So can you think of a time when you were invited to something uh, and you had to dress the part? Like you had to, you had to put your cl- certain clothes on in order to, 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 to fit in. Uh, maybe it was a uniform for a sports team. Uh, or maybe it was a uniform for a job that you go to. Uh, maybe you were in a wedding. Uh, maybe some of the, uh, you know, think about like having to put on a tuxedo or ladies having to put on those uh, uh, bridesmaids gowns or whatever, right? Or maybe it was attending a formal dance. Can you think of something like that? So Tasha and I and her mom and dad took a trip to Williamsburg one time. It was a little uh, brief vacation. And while we were there, we decided that we wanted to go out to a a nice meal. So we found a restaurant that was uh, supposed to be, you know, one of the nicer ones in the area. And and we uh, discovered that they required men to wear a coat and tie. Now, I happened to have a tie with me. And Tasha's dad happened to have a, a coat with him, but uh, we didn't have both. Neither of us had both things. So we decided we'd, we'd give it a try, and we'd go to the restaurant and see if they would let us in. So when we arrived, the maitre d' at the restaurant uh, looked at us and said, gentlemen, we, you know, we require coat and tie. And he said, now I have some loaners for you. And so they found me a, 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 a sports coat that I could put on, and they gave a tie to Tasha's dad. But Tasha's dad really wasn't interested in putting on a tie. And, uh, and he kind of pushed back a little bit, but they made it very clear to us that if we, if we weren't going to abide by their dress code, then we weren't, we weren't going to be eating. <laughs> so Tasha's dad had a choice to make. So uh, Jesus, when he talks about the kingdom of God, often compares the kingdom of God to a feast or to a banquet or a party. In the reading today, Jesus tells of a king who hosts a wedding banquet for his son. And really, it's quite the party. Uh, they've got couchon de lait, they have boiled crawfish, they have cowboy ribeyes. I mean, this is going to be quite the feast. And the king invites a group of people, but the first group ignores the invitation completely. Uh, We're actually told they make light of it, and one goes off to take care of his farm, and another goes off to take care of his business, and we're told the rest of the guests uh, seize the king's servants, and they mistreat them and even kill them. And uh, the king is not happy about this at all, and in the story responds accordingly. So who is this first group? Who who is this first group of people that are invited? Now, most scholars see this first group as the Jewish establishment of Jesus' day, the religious authorities of Jesus' day. 
Uh, they received Jesus' invitation to new life in God's kingdom, and they rejected it. Okay? Uh, so, after this first group rejects the invitation, uh, the king sends his servants out again and tells them to invite anyone and everyone to the party. He wants his banquet hall filled up. Uh, he even tells them to invite both the good and the bad. And I'd love that part of the story because it shows us that, you know, God, this invitation of the king, this invitation of God really is open to everyone. It's, it's open to all of us. And so the servants go out and they extend this invitation and we're told that the wedding hall is filled with guests. Uh, so if the first group is the Jewish religious establishment, who is the second group? Uh, so the second group that's invited to new life uh, in God's kingdom are non-Jews or the Gentiles. And this is really the story of the whole New Testament, right? It's a story about how Jesus' disciples begin in Jerusalem, and they do begin by inviting the, the Jewish people. And many of Jesus' disciples are Jewish. Uh, but then they go out from that place, and they extend this invitation to, uh, to, to Romans and to, and to Greek-speaking people and to anybody who will listen, and the gospel spreads all over the world, right? So the second group is the church. Uh, it's you and me. It's the Billions of people all across the world, across different cultures and different times, who have said yes to Jesus' invitation. And indeed, the wedding hall is filled with guests. But then something troubling happens. So just as it is today, the custom in Jesus' time was for people to wear appropriate attire to a wedding. I mean, when you go to a wedding, you, you dress appropriately, right? Right? And so when the king returns to the wedding banquet, he discovers that one of the guests is not wearing a, a wedding robe. He's not dressed properly. And the king has that person thrown out. So, so what's going on here? I mean, I, I, I'm curious about this, and I hope that you are too if you're engaged in this story. Uh, I want to go back to the questions I began with. Is Jesus saying that uh, someone who has said yes to God's invitation, so they've heard the invitation to life in the kingdom, a person who has even gone as far as to show up to the party, they, they, maybe they come to church, uh, that that person can still miss out on life with God? Is Jesus saying that uh, our God, who we know to be a God of love and mercy, that that God kicks people out of the kingdom of God? So uh, there's some debate about what the wedding robe represents in this parable. Uh, Gregory the Great, who was an early church father, said that the robe represented love. Uh, Augustine of Hippo, another great church father, agreed with him and said that uh, it would, the robe is charity, which is another uh, form of love or another word for love. Uh, others say that the robe is baptism. Some say the robe is faith. Uh, and these are all good answers. But I really like what John Calvin had to say about the robe. And, and this is what Calvin said. He said, in order to remain permanently in the king's house, we must put off the old self and put on a new life. I'm going to say that again. In order to remain permanently in the king's house, we must put off the old self and lead a new life. So uh, Paul talks about this old self and new self in many different places in his writings. And uh, one of the, uh, the, the clearest is in the book of Ephesians in the fourth chapter. And I just want to share this with you. Paul says this, You were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to clothe yourselves with the new self created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So the wedding robe is this new life in Christ that we are called to put on in response uh, to God's invitation. So listen to me. We have to get this. Uh, you and I have been invited to life in God's kingdom, to new life in God's kingdom. Uh, we can live in an interactive relationship with God now. Uh, we can live according to God's good and perfect will. We can. Uh, we do not have to be out of sync with God and out of sync with God's goodness. 
We can live an abundant life, Jesus says, an eternal kind of life. Uh, Paul says we can live the life that really is life. But we need to understand that this life that we're called to is very different than the life that we lead now or the life before we come to life in Christ. Uh, Paul describes these differences, uh, again, really well, uh, this time in the book of Galatians in the fifth chapter. So hear what, he has to, hear what he says here. The works of the flesh are obvious. And, and when Paul talks about the flesh, he's talking about uh, life, uh, you know, the old way, the old self. The works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery. I could do a whole sermon on that. <laughs> Enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. He says that's the, that's the you know, works of the flesh, life in the flesh. I'm warning you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So do you see the contrast that Paul is setting up there? Uh, when we say yes to Jesus' kingdom invitation, we turn towards life with God, and in doing so, we necessarily turn away from this old life, uh, life my way, a life of self-will and self-centeredness, right? So let's go back to this question. Is Jesus saying that a person who has said yes to God's invitation— a person who has gone as far as to show up at the party can still miss out on the fullness of life with God. You know, to tell you the truth, it happens all the time. Uh, there are people who participate in the life of the church. Uh, they go to Sunday school. They take Bible studies. They've, they've said yes to Jesus, and they've said yes to the invitation. They've been baptized. They're church members. But they still do not surrender their lives to God's way. They keep living their own way. Uh, Billy Sunday, who was a famous 20th century evangelist, said this once, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to a garage makes you an automobile. So increasingly, I see people in the church, people who will, you know, wear the name Christian, who really show no interest at all in living Jesus's way. Uh, now, when we think about Paul's list from Galatians, we like to very quickly point the finger and think about things like fornication and drunkenness. Yeah, those people who won't change their lives. But what about the rest of Paul's list? What about enmity? What about strife? What about jealousy? What about anger? What about quarrels and dissensions and factions? Uh, you ever see any of that kind of stuff in the church? And so I just got to say, if, if I claim the name of Christ and I'm engaged in any of those behaviors, I need to check my clothes. Uh, if I claim the name of Christ and I spread lies and rumors about people, which has become so commonplace on social media, right? If I'm engaged in that kind of life, I need to check my clothes. If I claim the name of Christ and I wish my opponents sick or dead, I need to check my clothes. If I claim the name of Christ and I really don't care about the poor or the oppressed or about justice in the world, I need to check my clothes. You with me? Now listen, I'm not talking about the times uh, when we try to do God's will and we fail. I mean, that happens to all of us, right? When we fall short. Um, and I have to believe that if this wedding guest uh, had any intention of putting on that wedding robe, if, if, he'd, if he'd left it behind, uh, if it was sitting somewhere in the banquet hall, uh, if he had one arm in and just kind of hadn't gotten it on, I have to believe that, that the king would have allowed him to put that robe on. Uh, I'm talking about the times when we know that God has called us to a different way, and we just refuse. We just keep doing it our way. I'm talking about the times uh, where we've so closed off our hearts to God's Spirit that we don't even listen or hear anymore. 
So is Jesus saying that a person who has said yes to God's invitation, a person who's come all the way into the life of the church, God's party, uh, can still miss out on the fullness of life with God? I think the answer is yes. That's what he's saying. Uh, Now, is Jesus saying that our God, Jesus' Father, the God of love and mercy, kicks some people out of the kingdom of heaven? Uh, So Tasha and me and her mom and dad are at this maitre d' station. Uh, I've put on my coat that they've given me, and uh, Tasha's dad's got the tie, and he's really trying to, trying to make up his mind about whether he's going to put on that tie or not. And there was just something in here, him that really was kind of resisting. And part of me understands that. I mean, I got, I've got that side of my personality too, that part of me that says, you're not going to tell me what to do. Uh, or maybe Tasha really, Tasha's dad really still needed to make a decision about, well, did he really want to go into this restaurant and eat or not, right? Maybe, maybe it really wasn't that important to him. What, what, what was he going to decide? Uh, but whatever his reason, if he had decided not to put on that tie and the maitre d' had not let us in to eat, okay, uh, did the maitre d' make that decision or did Tasha's dad make that decision? And I got to ask the same question about the king in this story. Uh, did the, the king kick this guy out? Or did the king simply fulfill a decision that this man had already made previously? And and the king just said, okay, do it. We're going to do it your way. Does God kick people out of the kingdom of heaven? Or does God simply say yes to the decision that we make ourselves? So there's a great C.S. Lewis quote. Y'all know I I always love to quote C.S. Lewis. Uh, He says this. There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, thy will be done. Two kinds of people in the end. Uh, Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, have it your way. We'll do it it your way. So let me ask you this. Uh, Have you heard and understood the invitation to life in God's kingdom? Do you know that invitation? And do you believe that you've said yes to that new life in Christ? If so, I just want to ask you today, check your clothes. Check them. Can you point to something that God has changed or remade or that has been healed in you in response to God's call to new life? Uh, What transforming, healing, or new life work is God doing in you right now? Uh, And what are you doing to cooperate, to to let your will and God's will, uh, you know, work together? Now, uh, I have to offer a little practical advice here for those of you who might be interested in how this life of transformation works. How uh, How does life with God, life in the Spirit, transform us? Uh, And so uh, there are many books on this topic, but one of the best I've found and one that uh, people have told me they find very helpful, I found it helpful, is a book, a series by James Bryan Smith called The Good and Beautiful God. And uh, we have groups in our church that are studying this book. And uh, I just encourage you, again, if you're interested in this life of transformation and how that happens, um, to to grab one of these books and uh, and study it. Uh, If you can study it with a group, that'd be the best thing of all. So I have some good news. Uh, As we stood there at that maitre d' stand and Tasha's dad tried to make up his mind about what he was going to do about that tie, he finally decided. And he uh, he put on the tie and I had on my coat and the maitre d' invited us in and they found us a lovely table and Tasha's mom and dad and I enjoyed a a wonderful meal together and it's a we have fond memories about it and it's something that we celebrate to this day. Uh, So Tasha's dad made up his mind. He wanted to come into the feast and participate fully in in that meal. And I guess the question I want to ask you to think about today is, what will you decide? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
bowing down you have my worship here I come So you and I have been invited to a new life in God's kingdom. Uh, we can live a life that's an interactive life with God. We're, we can live in an interactive relationship with God. We don't have to be out of sync with God and God's goodness. Uh, we can live what Paul calls a life that really is life, or what Jesus called an abundant life. Do you, do you believe that? Uh, do you want that life? If you do, 
then we are called as Christians uh, to give ourselves to Christ and then to clothe ourselves with a new self created in the likeness of God. Uh, And I just encourage you to uh, give yourself that life wholeheartedly. Give yourself to Christ wholeheartedly and know that he will be there to guide you in this journey. Go now with the blessings of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bye, everyone.